It was all smiles and cooperation at this week's Energy East meeting between Ontario's Premier Kathleen Wynne and Alberta Premier Jim Prentice. But while the mood was jovial, many hurdles exist in the plans to bring oil from Alberta's oil sands to maritime refineries. Joining us now for more on those hurdles and the possibilities for the pipeline, Brian Milner, Senior Economics Writer and Global Markets Columnist with The Globe and Mail. Brian, good to see you again. Welcome back. Happy to be here. Thanks. Okay, let's just check out this meeting that took place between Wynne and Prentice earlier this week. Kathleen Wynne wearing a Calgary St. Peter's jersey, incidentally, for part of that. Great How cup. depressing is How that? How depressing, yes. A great <laughs> cup bet gone south. Uh, basically, what was the purpose of the meeting? Well, essentially, uh, uh, Mr. Prentice is, is, is in Eastern Canada to, to shore up support for the pipeline and to make sure that uh, the two most powerful premiers in the, area, in the area that the pipeline is going to be traveling through, namely Ontario and Quebec, are on side. Uh, the fact is that this shouldn't have been necessary. This is a national project. Uh, Ontario and Quebec shouldn't even be able to set conditions for this, but they are. Well, hold off on those. We'll get to the conditions okay. in a second. Let's bring up, Sheldon, why don't we do this now? Let's bring the map up and just remind everybody the part of the country we're talking about, the route that the, map in that the pipeline intends to take. And Brian, maybe take us through this, because as we can see from this graphic here, there's not that much of the pipeline that is actually new construction, right? Well, that, that's right. The, the existing pipeline, which is a natural gas pipeline, uh, moves uh, gas from uh, the Saskatchewan-Alberta border, essentially, to eastern Ontario. Uh, that's been around for 55 years. Uh, no major problems that anybody's been able to cite. Uh, works pretty well, but it's underutilized, and TransCanada has long realized that it could be a lot more profitable if they were able to transport oil along that same route. And with the extension that would take it to ports in New Brunswick and Quebec where it could be shipped by tanker. And that extension, that part in red that we just saw there, how, what would be the cost of building that part of it? Well, we're looking at a $12 billion total cost, and that includes upgrading parts of the older pipeline and also building a little spur from the Alberta uh, terminus. And how much time do they suspect it will take to get all that done? If everything goes according to plan and there are no major delays, no regulatory hassles, it'll be at least 2018 before uh, that oil is being moved. And what stage are they at right now in terms of approvals and so on? They've just submitted their official proposal to the National Energy Board. It's 30,000 pages long. Uh, the National Energy Board has to review it and has to conduct environmental reviews. It has to talk to all the parties objecting to it and the supports for it and then it has to come to a conclusion of what might be required from TransCanada to make those approvals happen, which is guarantees on the security of the pipeline, the quality of the work, the fact that they have a plan in place to deal with emergencies, which they all have to have. All that stuff has to occur, and they have to have uh, the financing in place to do it. Did you say 30,000 pages? 30,000 pages. It's going to take four years just to read that, <laughs> let alone to get approval. Yes, uh, not too many of my colleagues would want to wade through the no entire kidding. proposal. No uh, kidding. Jim Prentice uh, has called this, and the other pipelines for that matter, a form of nation building that is crucial to Canada's future. Do you see it that way? Well, they, are, they always try to couch these things in terms of we, m we must make Canada a great nation by building the railway, transcontinental railway. That turned out to be true. Uh, does a new oil pipeline moving oil to the east uh, count as nation building? Uh, it does from the point of view that they will be able to take this incredibly valuable resource out of Alberta and do more with it than they're able to do now, which means that they can get a lot more money for it, which money that goes into the coffers of governments, that's very valuable. I mean, their estimate is an extra $10 billion in tax revenue over a period of time coming from this source. Uh, and the argument is that they're losing valuable tax revenue now because the oil they're producing in Alberta, they have to sell at an artificially low rate to American buyers because they can't get it to the East Coast. You say incredibly valuable resource. That incredibly valuable resource is cheaper to buy now than it has been in a long time. Well, that's right. And, and as oil prices uh, go down, uh, it makes these projects less and less viable in the short term. Mm -hmm. Problem is, if you're a pipeline builder, if you're an oil extractor, you can't think short term. You have to think long term. You have to look at what demand will be, 
what supplies you have coming on stream and what the global economy will look like 10, 20, 30 years down the road and whether or not there'll still be this demand in place. Now when proponents want these kinds of projects built, they make, I think it's fair to say, quite extravagant claims about, you know, we're going to create X number of jobs and it's going to represent this much of our gross domestic product and, and so on and so forth. And they're talking about more than 200,000 full-time equivalent jobs in the development and operation phases if this thing goes forward. I, know, I mean, is that realistic? They always overestimate the, uh, the economic benefits and they underestimate the risks. That's absolutely normal, just as the opponents overestimate the risks and underestimate the economic benefits. The fact is there is an economic benefit from getting Alberta oil to the coast, both west and east, which is the purpose of all these pipeline proposals, including Keystone, which would take it south. Uh, they've got to get the oil out. They're, they're producing, they have one of the world's greatest oil pools in the world, uh, but they're using technology from the mid 20th century. They've got to get that infrastructure up to speed to match what they're able to produce or it's not going to be very valuable. You do say there's an economic benefit to making this project happen. There is also, opponents would say, an environmental cost to making this project happen. On balance, do we know whether the economic benefits outweigh the environmental degradation that will take place to make it happen? Well, the fact is, I mean, the environment environmentalists are going to oppose every single extraction project and every single pipeline that carries that Just stuff. Just because they want us off carbon. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and they're never going to accept any additions to that system. Uh, if you're sort of in the middle, you're not pro-industry, you're not pro-environment, but you're neutral, you say, well, yes, I want a sustainable economy. I want a sustainable environment, but the world is running on this stuff. Uh, it's not going to change that quickly, even though alternative fuels are increasing, we will have much more renewable resources by, say, 2030 or 2040. The world will still be running on oil, natural gas, and even coal. So the fact is, do we, do we supply that or does somebody else supply it? And if we supply it, is it fair that we're always going to get artificially low prices because we can't get it to the global marketplace? Hmm. Uh, just in terms of, of political leadership on this, we've certainly heard Jim Prentice, the Premier of Alberta, weigh in strongly for it. Brad Wall, Premier of Saskatchewan, weighing in strongly for it. Uh, Kathleen Wynne, Philippe Couillard from Ontario and Quebec, uh, conditional approval for this. What about in the Maritimes? I mean, they stand to benefit as well. I haven't heard much from them. Where are they at on this? Well, it's interesting. The, the producers, of course, of this stuff are strong advocates because for them it's automatic tax revenue gains. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're in New Brunswick and your refinery capacity is increased, your terminal capacity is increased, that's a net economic gain in an area that's relatively economically depressed. So then you have to weigh, what about the risks to existing uh, industry? Agriculture and fisheries are the two that worry the most about being affected by this. Uh, is, what if there's an oil spill in the Bay of Fundy? That could be disastrous. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there's a problem in the St. Lawrence River, we already know about the beluga whale issue, which is that, that there's a, an important calving ground near the proposed terminus that TransCanada wants to build. Uh, those things have to be protected. Once the guarantees are in place for that, and you can convince the farm lobby and the fisheries lobby that, that there will be sufficient protection. and and they do know how to build these things so they don't automatically leak out in, underwater and they have to cross a lot of waterways to get there, uh, then you should have them on side because it will mean local jobs. I pointed out a second ago that, that um, Wynne and Couillard, the premiers of Ontario and Quebec, have offered conditional support. And I say conditional support because they did lay out seven conditions <laughs> or, I mean, call them what you want, seven conditions that that they said have to be met in order for them to fully support the project. What's the gist of those conditions? Well, the, the, the obvious ones and the ones that TransCanada would have to meet anyway, if it, if it has any common sense, are safety, uh, emergency plans for any spills, quick response times if there are any problems, uh, close supervision of the security of the pipeline, all those things will have to be met and TransCanada knows that and they do have the technology available to monitor those pipelines constantly and to keep track of any 
any potential risks. So that, that part makes complete sense. No province should want a pipeline going across its, its borders where the pipeline company says, well, it's built and that's fine and we're going to take our money and don't, don't call us if you have a problem. That's never going to happen. Uh, the other issues are uh, job-related. Well, yes, there will be jobs in all of these areas related to pipeline maintenance, management, and extension if you're in Quebec and East. Uh, but then you've got, you had another condition which they've sort of dropped, which is it has to be no net addition to the carbon issues from the source of the oil, which makes no sense because A, TransCanada doesn't control that, the National Energy Board doesn't review that, and this is the fact that the oil sands are polluting to some degree. Everybody knows that, but so is every other oil production facility on Earth. And uh, they can't be responsible for limiting that, that carbon footprint any more than anybody else can. And Ontario and Quebec, A, have no right to make those demands, and B, they know darn well that it's irrelevant. So they're not going to So pursue. it's a bluff? Well, they've dropped the requirement already. They say, we're not talking about carbon issues at the source. We're talking about carbon issues as they cross our province. But they've never explained what those could be. I mean, how much more environmental risk could there be from the pipeline? Well, environmentalists will tell you there will be leaks, there will be huge problems, there are chemicals they use to dilute the bitumen. If that leaks out into the groundwater or into the lakes and streams, it's very damaging. Uh, there are huge risks to the farm, farm soil as it crosses those properties. Uh, but again, those, that pipeline already exists mm -hmm. and it's already moving gas. And this argument that, oh, you can't switch from one to the other and this bitumen is more dangerous to carry because it's full of chemicals and, and it's a much higher risk of damaging and polluting waterways. Well, that's simply not true. The diluted bitumen will be carried on that pipeline just as safely as a natural gas, from what I can understand, as well as light oil and, and other oils that are no riskier than gas. Here's what Dwight Newman, who's a professor of law at the University of Saskatchewan, wrote about this in the Globe and Mail uh, just uh, the other day. Part of being part of a federation is that there is an acceptance of the definitive role of the national government making decisions on major matters of the national transportation network. In this case, through the careful analysis of the National Energy Board, which functions as an administrative tribunal independent of political influence. Every element of the national transportation network will create some inconvenience in somebody's backyard. But the building of a country cannot be held hostage to the not-in-my-backyard syndrome that so quickly arises in any discussion. How much of this do you think is NIMBYism? Well, I think it's, not, it's more than that. It, it's, it's provincial government saying, well, the federal government isn't saying anything about this. This is an opportunity for me to get more for my province. I can get more job guarantees. I can, get, <clears throat> I can look like I care about the environment. Uh, I can be proactive, which is good for, to shore up my local support. And, and that's what they're doing, essentially. And they're all doing it. They're doing it in BC with the cross BC issues. Uh, and there's no reason why you'd expect Ontario and Quebec not to be out there saying, you know, we have interests in this. Our gas producer, our gas distributors, for instance, are worried about production cuts because you're switching to oil. What will we do in the winter time? We need guarantees to protect them. All that stuff is legitimate from a political standpoint if there's, the federal government is sort of sitting on its hands and, and just saying, well, it's up to the National Energy Board, don't bother us. Uh, that's typically because we're heading into an election next year and the last thing the Harper government wants is a pipeline problem on the election agenda. Uh, given that some of the terminals though are in Quebec, does the Premier of Quebec actually have the power to stop this if he wants to? Well, he can certainly throw up enough roadblocks to make it impossible to get that terminus built in Quebec. Uh, that requires land, it requires construction uh, permits, all that stuff. Ontario can do the same to construction going across the province. In other words, they can throw up enough impediments, legal impediments, they can just slow the whole thing down uh, with, with no great difficulty. One of the things that we've certainly heard about the Northern Gateway Project in British Columbia is that the Aboriginal land claim issues are so 
deeply profound that many people think the thing is never going to happen. I haven't heard any references to Aboriginal issues as it relates to this pipeline. Have you? Uh, a few uh, in, in the Maritimes from, from the, uh, the fisheries, basically, worried about their abilities to maintain that, that uh, very important resource. Uh, not much otherwise, because the pipeline already exists where it's moving across Manitoba and most of Ontario uh, and Saskatchewan, so you're not going to see a lot of that. It's close to the border. It's not crossing uh, uh, reserves, for instance, uh, in, in for the most part. It is going through the Ottawa area, so it's avoiding the reserves in the south. Uh, so we don't see a lot of that. But the fact is that of all the pipeline proposals, this is the one that was supposed to be the least controversial and the least problematic. Yes, if you look at Northern Gateway and Keystone XL and Energy East, this was supposed to be the gimme, right? And Trans Mountain. Yes, this is supposed to be the one while it's mostly built already. Mm -hmm. It's so logical economically. How could anybody argue against it? Uh, it means that we're displacing foreign oil that's coming into eastern Canada. That sounds good on paper. It means that we'll actually get the proper global price for this product instead of the price the Americans feel like giving us. It gives us more leverage and bargaining with the Americans. All those things seem like a good thing. The federal government we know is very pro Keystone XL pipeline. Have they weighed in as forcefully in favor of this project? No, and that, that's the problem. Uh, they're, f they're very forceful on Keystone because it's an American political problem, and they can say, hey, we're defending Canadian interests. They do not want to wade in on any of these Canadian projects aggressively in case it comes back to bite them in the election campaign. Hmm. So, Even though, by the way, all three federal parties support this pipeline. And it's interesting that the, uh, Jim Prentice, of course, a former member of uh, Stephen Harper's cabinet, and yet there doesn't appear to be a lot of teamwork there to make this thing happen. Well, it's sort of uh, from the federal point of view, well, we've got the National Energy Board. They have to go through the process. They know that's a three-year process. By the time this is done, and it's at least a year before the National Energy Board even releases a preliminary view, uh, the election will be over. Uh, it's not a problem for us now, so why make it one when we don't have to? Now that we've uh, talked about Energy East, do you want to talk about the American League East? A lot, of big, a lot of big moves there, Brian. Well, actually, it's probably of more interest to a lot of people uh, who are tired of pipeline debates. But, but in terms of the economy, this, this matters a lot. And uh, I don't think that the federal government is doing its job. They're not even doing it on the regulatory front. They, they sort, of, sort of drift around the problem. They're not forceful. There are some provincial regulations on, for instance, developing oil sands oil. But those regulations are pretty mild. Uh, the fact is that industry is doing more about these things than government, and that's not the way it should be at this point. And we thank you for coming in this Friday to help us understand it better. Brian Milder from pleasure. the Globe and Mail. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.